You know, I get that droids have tones, and Chopper doesn't really speak in typical uh, droidese or whatever. But it's kind of amusing to me that Ezra's slowly been picking up on his patterns. So here we are. I knew we'd get there eventually. Clone Wars had several episodes that I didn't care for. Okay, that's not fair. Clone Wars had a lot of episodes I didn't care for. But what I mean is, I never like the big mysticism-y episodes. It's just not my thing. You know, it's coffee at best. So, I look at this episode and I'm like, Ugh, okay, yeah, big mysticism thingy. You gotta follow the prophecy. Gotta use the vague powers of the Electro Staff to generate a field that somehow prevents gravity from affecting the ship in the same way as it does other ships. Oh, and also, we've got to you know, find a way to do a hyperdrive jump through a star a collapsed, or excuse me, an imploded star cluster. Just, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> I'm just going to hand wave it away and move on. I'm not going to complain about it any more than I already have. Just not my thing. <clears throat> I do like the characterization we get here. So, first of all, they're detaining these refugees, right? And then they mention the thought of executing them. Why? I mean, I know that this is the Empire, and they're evil, dead puppies. <laughs> but otherwise, I couldn't think of any actual reason for this. They're literally pacifist refugees. What's their crime here? I do like Hondo in this episode. No, legitimately. In addition to the obvious fact that he's very Hondo. Like, like okay, so... I'm going to inform Ezra there's some refugees. Then I'm going to sell out the refugees to the Empire. Then you're going to find the refugees, rescue them, and I get paid twice by both sides. Everybody's happy. And what's funny is that really does actually... There's a degree of logic to that, as horrible as that sounds. And he continues to do that for a while. I think that's one of the reasons I like Hondo, the later Hondo, more than the earlier Hondo. He's a lot less openly malicious and evil, and far more inclined to cooperation. He's still selfish. He's still trying to squeeze out the best deal for himself. But he's not selfish to the point of an extreme. And, I, and I'm with that, you know. Anyways. He's also awesome. Anyways, so, I do like how they mention Ashla. Ashla will lead us forward. Kanan flat out says that the Force has many names, and that makes sense. For such a cosmic power that a large number of beings have been able to sense over the millennia, it would make sense that other people have different terms or concepts or whatever for the Force. If anything, I find it strange we don't hear more of those over the course of the show. <clears throat> we get more characterization for Zeb as well, in particular. I don't, you know, I, I don't like being called Captain. What I like best about that is, despite the fact that he's been running with this crew for a long time, at this point, a bare minimum of two years. We don't know how long exactly he's been with the crew before the show started. And he never told any of them about the fact that he used to be captain of the Honor Guard. We got a little bit of that Honor Guard you know, foreshadowing all the way back in Season 1 with Callus, uh, Agent Callus. But he didn't tell them. Now, of course, that's not a I'm keeping secrets thing so much of a I am ashamed thing. It's actually a bit of a shame, I think, that his character arc is condensed to a single episode. Because the whole point of this episode is Zeb trying to overcome his shame in order to reclaim his place as basically captain of the Honor Guard. It's just in this case he is no longer fighting to defend, but fighting to guide or lead or you know get them to safety. There's different ways to fight, after all. It's just, it's condensed to one episode, so it loses a lot of the impact. But it's still a powerful bit, and of course Steve Lum is a talented actor, so he gets across a lot of the emotional range that's needed here. I do like the trick at the beginning of the episode, or I guess in the middle of the episode, you know, the fool, the child, and the warrior. And it's like, okay, so obviously the fool is Hondo, the child is Ezra, and the warrior is Zeb. I mean, that just makes sense, right? No, actually, Kalis is, or Kalis, excuse me, Kalis is the warrior, and Zeb is the child. They never actually really answer who the fool is. She gives kind of a, let's be honest with ourselves, a nonsense answer about, oh no, you're all of these parts, just at different points in your life. In other words, that the only one to really lead them forward is Zeb. That he was all three par parts to lead them forward. And I'm kind of with that, but again, whatever. I do like how Zeb flat out calls her out. There's another part of the prophecy. Oh, you types always pull this. I hate to nitpick. I, I know that sounds strange. You guys probably think I love to nitpick, but I don't. But I, I do tend to think about things, especially the construction of logic. 
And I have to wonder, given how much time passes between them getting an alert and them being pulled out of hyperspace, they have traveled literally light years in that period of time. That's a huge span. So either their sensors are incredibly good and consequently incredibly fast, or they were traveling extremely slow for hyperspace standards because they come out of hyperspace before the anomaly. In fact, ugh, what is with my yawn today? By accounts, immediately before it would have actually destroyed them. Anyways, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just, whatever. I hate to bring this up yet again, speaking of nitpicking. But notice how Season 2, once again, has been doing the whole ship thing much better than Season 1 was. I wonder how much of that is because of deliberate design or because you know, it's just something they're going for. Because in all of Season 2, the Imperial ships that they're fighting against are much lower tier and much smaller, with most of the specific craft they're going up against being the light cruisers. Now, that's kind of awesome, actually. And it's kind of neat because, once again, it keeps things on the right tier for where our heroes are at. So it, it's just good stuff. And that's, I just mentioned it one final time, hopefully, because I wanted to show Season 2 in contrast to Season 1. So then, I, I, what do I say about the rest of the episode? <laughs> okay, so we've got this, and then we go through the anomaly, and then we go to Hyperdrive, which he activates with his staff somehow. I, I, whatever. I have no idea what happens there, and I don't even want to. But what I do want to know is, Hera makes a random comment about the system being charted, so now they can send other people here. Now that makes a degree of sense, but forgive me for getting once again into the setting building thing. But charting a system in Star Wars terms doesn't necessarily mean knowing where it is. That is relevant, of course, but really the relevant part is figuring out exactly how to get there. Now, I suppose she could be inferring exactly that, that they will spend the time and processing power to map out a good hyperspace lane, or a, you know, one or several good hyperspace routes to get to here, now that they know exactly where it is, and that makes a little bit more sense to me. And, and I only point that out because, because of that sense-making. That's kind of a neat touch. It means they are in a world that most people don't even know exists that they can send future refugees to. And unless they are specifically tracked there, that's never going to be a problem for anyone else finding it. Just, just a neat little touch I wanted to point out. That's actually all I've got. I'll see you guys next time.